Hello, everyone. Thanks, as always, for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. And we have a really special, very informative uh, and wonderful presentation for you today. I'm Rita Wolfson, and I'm the creator of Financial Social Work. And I'm hoping to be able and our guest speaker today is Paul McCourse. And while I've never met him in person, we have worked on a few projects together. And he is a graduate of the Center for Financial Social Work. And we're so happy to have him as part of the work to become a graduate. There's an essay involved. And Paul wrote his essay on Bitcoin. And I found it so interesting, I thought, I bet a lot of other people would like to know more about Bitcoin also. And that's how we all ended up together today. So some of our most commonly asked questions with some suggestions before we get started, uh, check the chat box for any messages. Um, Fonda will have the log me in contact if you have any technical issues, she'll have that in there. Bonda is our everything go-to person. We're so glad she's here with us and Paul's here with us. Uh, we don't share slides. They are proprietary. Uh, uh, our, the recording will be on our website from this webinar, our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Um, probably not later today, probably more likely next week. Um, any questions you have, you can type them into the question box as we go along and we'll answer as many uh, as time permits. There are no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar. Just a lot of great content. So before we get started, I'd like everyone to center yourself because when we talk about money, a lot of thoughts, feelings, attitudes all come up. So let's all take a deep breath in and out. I would like to begin with our financial social work affirmation that goes like this. Just for today, I will love myself enough to fear, to face my fears, practice self-acceptance and embrace hope. Just for today, I will silence my inner critic speak my truth and make peace with my past. And I will give myself permission to eliminate toxic people, beliefs and behaviors from my life. And just for today, I will prepare for a better tomorrow by making friends with my money and with myself today. And I'd like to think that this pretty much captures what financial social work is about. So let's start off with a poll. We have a few today to give you a chance to participate. Okay, polls, 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 here you go. I'm going to launch, I only have one. So, have you, okay, launch, ever attended a financial social work monthly free webinar? Okay, uh, we're fairly split. Okay, so about 70% of you have voted. I'll give you a few more seconds. And well, I'm glad I asked it. It kind of makes my day. Okay, I usually tell our guest speakers that we have the greatest audience because they always participate. So we are up to 80%. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you. So the majority of you have attended our webinars in the past. I wasn't sure, I told our guest speaker that I had a feeling most people were here because they really wanted to know more about Bitcoin. And I wouldn't blame them because 
That's one of the reasons I'm here. The other would be that it's our webinar. So for those of you who are new to us today, just a quick overview of financial social work and the intersection of politics, the economy, social work, economic and social justice. That intersection makes a big difference in everything that we do. And you can see how much of it uh, involves money. I'm not going to read you all of that. We know that no one chooses to have many money problems, but most people do. So there is good news. No one can or needs to know everything or the same things about money. However, in all economic times, everyone does need to know certain things about money. So this is what part of the essence of financial social work looks like. We come from this perspective that it's our relationship with our money and with ourselves that drives our financial behavior, which is how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. And that's what determines our financial circumstances. And my little dancing arrow always shows you that that's where behavioral change happens. It's what we do. And that's what drives our financial circumstances. So what makes the financial social work? It goes beyond dollar cents, debt, and budgets because there's so much more involved in helping clients take control of their money and gain control of their lives is a psychosocial behavioral model. So it explores the fundamentals of financial well-being, the thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, experiences, and values, again, that address financial behavior, how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. That's the true heart of all of my work. So financial social work looks like this. It's interactive, reflective, and strength-based educational, motivational, and supportive. It's a holistic approach that's multidisciplinary, healing, hopeful, and helpful. And it works beautifully with individuals and with groups. It is very much about changing our relationship with our money, recognizing, embracing, and taking ownership of personal financial health, changing our relationship with self. So that piece is about self-discovery, self-care and self-healing. Then we have changing the thinking, which I've already described to you, and changing the behavior. So the goal of financial social work is to make peace with our money. So now I'm really excited to turn this over to Paul McCourse so he can introduce himself further. And I have to find, okay, tell you about himself and give us a training on Bitcoin. If you have questions, you can put them in the, um, question box as we go along, and then we will ask them to me or to Paul at the very end. There you go, Paul. All right, great. Thank you, Rita. Happy to be here presenting on Bitcoin and does Bitcoin fit with financial social work? My name is Paul McCourse, and I am a graduate of the Center of Financial Social Work, and I'm a financial social work educator. And I have quite a bit of slides here, so we're going to, to get started. All right, I have a quick disclosure here to read off. And it looks like I'm not able to read it with that on there. So I'm going to read it. I'm just going to slide this out of the way here. All right, there we go. 
All right, this presentation is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as investment advice. This presentation is my own and does not reflect the views of any other financial social worker, CFP professional, or the Center for Financial Social Work or CFP board. This presentation is not and should not be taken as a definitive discussion of applicable law. All the relevant risks with respect to these products or a statement of my position on any particular product. A number of concerns have been raised regarding the cryptocurrency and ICO markets, including that as they are currently operating, there is substantially less investor protection than in our traditional securities markets with correspondingly greater opportunities for fraud and manipulation. All right, so with that, we're going to go straight to the polling station here. And I am going to ask you a question to find out how much you know about Bitcoin. And there we go. And let's wait for the information to come in here. We'll just give it a little bit more time. And it looks like most people are responding with the second choice there i've heard of it but know very little and let's we'll wait another a few more seconds to see if we can get above 80 percent voted and that looks like that is right now so i'm going to close the poll and share the results and as you can see there the majority have heard of it, but know very little. So I hope I can add to your understanding of Bitcoin today. And I wanna let you first know that if you are still a little confused as I go through this, please understand that that is, that is, is normal for something that um, like Bitcoin, it is a new technology and it is going to test your, it is going to test the norms that we are used to. So here we go. I'm going to read a quote here from the inventor of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi said in 2010, writing a description for this thing for general audiences is bloody hard. There's nothing to relate it to. And when I was putting this presentation together, I really felt the same way. Um, all right. Okay, this little information box keeps getting in my way. Let me see if I can just simply Did that work. Yeah, that worked. Okay. All right, so moving on to our Bitcoin, Bitcoin training goals. So I want to talk about Bitcoin, what it is and how it works. I want to talk about Bitcoin's industry and how it is full of misunderstanding, deception, fraud, and scams. I want to talk about why Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. That may be something that um, a lot of you uh, haven't heard before. And I also want to talk about how the authentic Bitcoin system can change the way we earn, spend, save, and share. All right, to start off here with the first bit of definition, and I'm going to add to it, Bitcoin is computer code. So Bitcoin is computer code that is programmed to create an electronic cash system which uses the internet to send and receive Bitcoins. So it's computer code, which means that you cannot, uh, Bitcoin is not tangible. You can't hold it, you can't feel it, smell it, taste it. It is uh, electronic, it lives on, um, on bytes, ones and zeros on, on the computer. All right, and this is a visual de depiction of Bitcoin. Just to give you an idea, Bitcoin, the internet of money, so you can see two individuals on either side of the world and they are using their computers to interact with the Bitcoin system. You can see the Bitcoin system there represented by that, that uh, shiny token there. And so when a user uses the Bitcoin system to say, send somebody Bitcoin, they are going to pay a small user fee. And that user fee should be small for a system that is built to be competitive with all the other companies in this world and, and um, products and services out there. And so maybe a hundredth of a cent, maybe a thousandth of a cent is what you would pay to send Bitcoin around the world. And that's much less than what you would see, of course, with like a Western Union or even your bank to wire. Um, you know, a thousandth of a cent is very little. But that's what, you're, that's what you can see here, just a visual 
depiction of what is taking place. And one thing I do want to also mention is Bitcoin, it goes beyond being a electronic cash system. All right, and we're going to talk about that. So um, let me just talk about that really quick. So Bitcoin, much like when electricity was being installed in people's homes back, you know, uh, back well before our time, uh, individuals thought of it as being light. Light is being installed because of the invention of the light bulb, the electricity um, being installed in somebody's house was, was thought of as, as, as bringing light into the home. But as time went on, inventors and engineers and entrepreneurs found different use cases for electricity outside of it being just to, to, to turn on a light bulb. So much like um, electricity, Bitcoin is the same in the sense that in the beginning, people see it as a electronic cash system, but in reality, it can do so much more than just be used as, as cash. And that is all thanks to Bitcoin being a system. And you can see here, this is the Bitcoin system. It is, it is the Bitcoin token that lives on the Bitcoin digital ledger. So you can see the token plus the ledger, that is the Bitcoin system. And the token lives on the ledger and it, it's represented by, by information that's on the ledger. Some facts about the Bitcoin token is there's approximately 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be issued. Each Bitcoin is made up of 100 million Satoshis. So one Bitcoin equals 100 million Satoshis, sort of like $1 equals 100 pennies. Um, this digital ledger keeps record of all of Bitcoin's transactions. The digital ledger is decentralized. It is a decentralized database. Um, that's an amazing superpower of Bitcoin, and that's one of its main breakthroughs is it's decentralized. It is a public ledger. Um, unlike anything we really know on the internet, this is actually a public resource that was created for us to use and to maintain. Um, the digital ledger is also known as a blockchain. And a lot of people get confused when they hear that term blockchain because it 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 brings up images in our brain that are hard to relate to a cash system but we'll talk about that but just so you know this digital ledger is also known as a blockchain it can also be known as a decentralized database so those can be interchangeably used adding to the definition bitcoin system is a public resource bitcoin was introduced to the world in 2008 by an anonymous inventor using the name Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi released this um, invention to us and took no credit, used actually a, a fake name, Satoshi Nakamoto, and remained anonymous um, through, through introducing this technology, getting it up and running, and working out some bugs, and then left in 2008. Satoshi, uh, excuse me, Satoshi left the community in 2011. People would say that, uh, and it's, it's speculated that Satoshi remained anonymous um, introducing this technology because Satoshi wanted this technology to stand on its own. Satoshi didn't want to, you know, um, link or tether themselves to this technology because maybe they may, they, they may, um, uh, people may not adopt this technology because of the person who invented it. So that may be one reason why Satoshi was anonymous and when Satoshi left in 2011, uh, Satoshi may have been, there could have been many reasons why Satoshi left, but in 2011, Bitcoin was being recognized around the world and it was actually being used for criminal activity on a dark web website called the Silk Road. And around that, that's around that time when Satoshi left and maybe Satoshi was maybe afraid of of backlash or was afraid of or maybe even ashamed of the way this tech his technology was being used for bad um a side note the uh, the uh the fbi raided that site closed it down and convicted ross albright a young man at the time of, of running the site and ross uh, is now serving two life sentences plus 40 years and no possibility of parole in prison. So Satoshi may have left because just wanted to, to get away from, from that. But 
the Bitcoin system now, uh, adding to the definition, the Bitcoin system is a data ledger. It is an electronic cash system that is programmed to record all its transactions on a data ledger that is called Bitcoin's blockchain. The, la the ledger is called a blockchain because blocks of transactions are added to Bitcoin's ledger approximately every 10 minutes. So you can see there at the bottom these blocks and they have the transactions that were done in those, those 10 minutes. So they represent approximately 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes worth of Bitcoin transactions. And the blocks you can see there at the bottom in, in yellow, they are different sizes because the amount of transactions varies with people's use and, and the time of the days and, and things going on. So that's why it's called a blockchain. It's really just pages of a ledger. It's, it's like thinking of a ledger where every 10 minutes a new page is added to that ledger. And um, or you can think of it as a, a chain of blocks of data. The Bitcoin system is decentralized. The Bitcoin system is decentralized. It has no central point of control or governing force. Um, a quote here from Satoshi Nakamoto at the bottom in 2009, with e-currency based on cryptographic proof without the need to trust a third party middleman, money can be secure and transactions effortless. So Satoshi is saying that this is one of, this is one of the superpowers of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized and it doesn't require a middleman. A middleman like a bank um, they charge to be a trusted middleman. They charge us service fees and account fees and all types of fees to trust them with our money. And Satoshi is saying without having a, he built a system that doesn't require a middleman. So it allows us to, um, to do things that are going to be much faster because we don't have to go through a middleman and potentially, and, 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 and it's more secure. Because we know that a lot of times when we give our, our information to middlemen, to companies, they can get hacked and we hear of hacks taking place all of the time. So we trust our information with a, lot of, with a lot of companies and we actually pay them because they are a trusted middleman, but a lot of times their trust, they break our trust. So that's why this Bitcoin system is so incredible is it isn't, it's built not to need them, not to need those middlemen. It's decentralized. Moving on, Bitcoin is an economy. That's why Bitcoin is able to, to still exist is because it actually has economic, it's actually, Satoshi created Bitcoin to economically incentivize people to use it, to have the public use it, and incentivize the public to actually maintain it. Bitcoin needs to be maintained by humans, and they need to be incentivized because their time is money and they have overhead costs associated with it. We'll talk more about that. But Bitcoin's digital ledger system operates by paying its own form of money, the Bitcoin token, the humans contain its ledger. So once again, Bitcoin is a system that, that is a digital ledger that uses the Bitcoin token to incentivize the ledger to be maintained by humans. So humans are being paid Bitcoin token to maintain it. So how does a person obtain Bitcoin tokens? Well, first off, in order to have Bitcoin tokens, um, you must download a wallet. And there are lots of wallets out there. And there are, today, there are lots of um, crypto, so-called cryptocurrencies, which spawned out of when Bitcoin was created in 2008. Um, after years after, new tokens started to arise. People started to create these new tokens. So there's different wallets for different tokens. But there are Bitcoin wallets out there. So you get a wallet and the wallet, it will keep track of your Bitcoin on the, the, the blockchain, Bitcoin's blockchain, it's data ledger, because that's where your Bitcoin are really stored um, and information on the ledger. So it keeps track of that information and it also keeps track of a private key or password that is needed to unlock those coins on the ledger so that you can use them. It's all very seamless, but that's kind of how it works in the background. Your coins aren't actually in the wallet. They're on the blockchain, the data, Bitcoin's data ledger, but the wallet just keeps track of that information and updates. Okay, so how do you get the Bitcoin tokens? Once you have the wallet, you can 
earn them, you can be given them, or you can buy them. So you can earn them as a um, as actually a data processor for the system. So you can work for the Bitcoin system and you can process its data, its transactions, and make and in return, you can the system will actually is programmed to pay out Bitcoin tokens as a subsidy to subsidize the public to maintain the system. And the um, the data processors, aka miners, they're also known as miners, uh, they will usually take those coins after they earn them and they will take them to an exchange and they will sell them to people who would like to buy them and they'll sell them for fiat dollars and they'll take those dollars and pay their overhead fee associated with, with maintaining the Bitcoin system. We'll talk more about that. Another way to earn Bitcoin is to sell a product or service and ask for Bitcoin in return. So if Rita wanted to earn Bitcoin, uh, Rita could add a additional payment option on her website to sell her products and services, her certificate, um, certification service, uh, our product to individuals in return for Bitcoin. So she would have her, her wallet address available for anybody who wanted to send Bitcoin to it. In return, she would give them the um, certification or any other product or service. So that's another way to do it. You can sell things. And there are actually websites where you can actually put up content, you know, videos or any, anything like that, um, music, and you can charge Bitcoin for individuals to see that content. And that would be like a stream um, You can also be given Bitcoin. That's obvious. You can be gifted Bitcoin. Somebody can maybe want to introduce it to you, so they give it to you. You can also buy it. So that comes back to what I talked about earlier, how those those data processors, the Bitcoin data processors, aka miners, go to the exchanges with the Bitcoin that they earned from the Bitcoin system because they were maintaining it. So the Bitcoin system paid them in the Bitcoin. They take those Bitcoins to an exchange and they sell them to somebody who has dollars who wants to buy them from them. So there are hundreds of exchanges, um, but be aware that there is a because this technology is fairly new, it's only like 11 years old, over 11 years old, the Bitcoin system, there hasn't been um, much or a whole bunch of, of resources to allow for the um, regulatory oversight of this, this industry. It's, it's, getting, it's getting more attention and more resources to regulate it, but uh, currently it's, it's, it's still, there's still a lot, of, a lot of fraud and deceptions taking place. So you have to be very, be very cautious whenever, if you ever do use an exchange because they um, can be hacked. You can lose your coins, they can be manipulated, they can you know, be um, fraudulent. But that is how you would get, obtain the Bitcoin tokens. You can earn them, be given them or buy them, but you do need a wallet. All right, so this is really what the Bitcoin process looks like. And so what we see here is first off, we see all these individuals out there and they have these, these little computer units. They're all holding their computer units. Those are the data processors, AKA also known as miners. And what they are doing with those machines is they are directing that computing power towards maintaining the Bitcoin system. So those computers are actually, they are built specifically to maintain the Bitcoin system. And so there's a huge industry out there selling these specialized computers, these ASIC units, application specific integrated circuit computers that do only nothing but manage the Bitcoin system. So these individuals, they have to buy these computers, they have to run them with electricity, they have to cool them with electricity, they have to house them. So there's a lot of expenses that they incur with maintaining the Bitcoin system, this, this public system, but they are incentivized to do it. They're not doing it for free. And so what we see here is we see them, they're all directing their computing power at the blockchain that you see there at the bottom. And so they're, they're making sure that all the incoming transactions that you see up in the upper right hand corner, all these transactions are being created by users. And those transactions come in as you can see there as the ones and zeros and all these data processors, their goal is to 
take the most recent these most recent transactions in this you know most recent 10 minutes to build them into a new block a block of transactions and they need to do it they want to do it before all the other miners and when they do that they are when they build the block first they get to attach it to the blockchain and in return the blockchain pays them 100% of all of the all of the user transaction fees associated with those transactions those small fees you know like a hundredth of a cent a thousandth of a cent times you know as many of the use as many of the transactions that are taking place so the data processor gets all those user transaction fees plus a block reward subsidy that Satoshi Nakamoto built into the system to incentivize these data processors in the beginning when transactions would be low because it's a new system, people aren't using it. This subsidy is designed to offset um, these data processors costs. And in the long run, um, this block reward subsidy, which today is six and a quarter Bitcoin. Uh, back in 2009, it was 50 Bitcoin. Every four years on average, uh, it, it is cut in half. So it went from 50 to 25 to 12 and a half to today it's six and a quarter Bitcoin. Every 10 minutes, one of these data processors, AKA miners receives six and a quarter Bitcoin plus all of the block transaction fees. The subsidy eventually is going to fade away and the system is going to need to be able to sustain based on the block transaction fees. So um, with more adoption, the more possibility that this Bitcoin system actually um, continues on. All right, so there is the, the data processor miner with, with the wallet out and receiving the Bitcoin because they just attached the most recent block there, which you can see in dash, in, uh, attached by dashes. And okay, we're going back to the polling station with, a, with another poll here. And this one is going to be Let's see here. It is going to be what country has the most Bitcoin data processors, aka miners, all those individuals with their specialized computers. All right, we got results coming in here. Let's wait a, about 10 more seconds. All right, great. So we are almost up to that 80% participation. Let's see. Let's see if we can just get 70% here. And there we go. So everybody is correct. Uh, well, the majority is correct here. So the consensus is China. And it is true. China represents, I think, um, well, I know it's over 50% of the data processors, but I'm pretty sure it's actually over 60%. Well, over 60% data processors are in China. So good job there. And that is also where the those the specialized computers are mainly manufactured is in China too. Those ASIC units is what they're called. All right. So now we'll move on to the next slide here. Move this out of the way. All right. So Bitcoin superpowers. So let's kind of summarize everything. So, so far we've talked about that Bitcoin is an electronic cash system. So it's not, so Bitcoins are, are digital, they're electronic. We cannot hold them, taste, taste them, fill them, touch them. Um, so if somebody tries to sell you a coin and they say it's a Bitcoin, you know better. Um, and these are the additional superpowers that this system has. It is, um, what we talked about is decentralized, no central point of control or governing power. So there's no bank, there's no um, Google, there's none of these companies that they make their money off of being the middleman. They make their money 
off of siphoning immense wealth from the the industry and their job is to be the trusted middleman but a lot of times we know that they're we can't we can't quite trust them because they've broken that trust before they mismanaged our, our data they've done all these things but this is bitcoin is decentralized okay bitcoin is trustless so there's no trusted middleman needed those data processors that are all in that are majority in china those are those are considered in the bitcoin system non-trusted middleman we don't need to trust them because they simply follow the bitcoin rules as long as they follow the bitcoin rules and they're all um they're all being monitored by one another for being honest to you know to make sure that everybody's being honest so we don't need to trust them so everybody you know be concerned oh wait they're all in china well the way the bitcoin system works is it tests our norms you know we would think well if they're all in china that's a threat to our country but in reality um with the bitcoin system that is not a that is not a threat because that's the bitcoin system was built in a way to prevent that from being a threat and all of these superpowers here they they really can um uh, they could deserve a lot more time but we're just going to go through them really quick here uh the bitcoin system is scalable meaning that as the demand grows for more transactions on the bitcoin system the bitcoin system the blocks the ledger is able to grow with the demand so there's no bottleneck there and that is that is how the real bitcoin system is designed to work today what we call what the mainstream calls bitcoin is not what i'm describing here and we'll get to that in a minute okay microtransactions costing less than one hundredth of a penny and even less possibly more but transactions on the bitcoin system are designed to be very inexpensive so if i wanted to send bitcoin to another country through western union i'm going to be paying a lot of money and there's going to be time involved and, and and or if i wanted to wire it through my bank there's going to be steps and it's going to cost me probably 10 20 dollars to do that this system here this competitive advantage it's costing a hundredth of a cent so there's so much that can be done just with that alone Moving on, it's continuously audited and transparent. So Bitcoin is transparent. So it is designed to be compliant um, with, with, uh, with a lot of the rules and regulations to prevent from money laundering and criminal activity and terrorist funding and all that stuff. It is transparent. It is continually audited and transparent. Data processors continually verify and update the ledger with new transactions. It is permissionless. Anyone can use, build upon and work for the bitcoin system without permission so those data processors they don't need anybody's permission to start working for the system and earning those bitcoins i don't need anybody's permission to build a business using bit using bitcoin i don't need anybody's permission to use bitcoin it is permissionless this is a public this is a um a, basically a public utility it is it is a public system that satoshi nakamoto created for us the people and that's why it's, it's such a revolution because um, the system works uh, to uh, be per permissionless. It is economically driven. The data processors, the miners, are incentivized to maintain Bitcoin's digital ledger, the blockchain. It is secure. It uses the secure hashing algorithm 256, the SHA-256. It is frictionless. It is very fast to send Bitcoin transactions because it is based on uh, the digital age, the, the internet, and we know that you can you can basically send an email pretty fast and just, just the same with these electronic cash transactions. It is non-duplicable. So there's no counterfeit coins. There's nobody can go out there and take the same Bitcoin and use it to buy the same, you know, to spend on multiple things um, at the same time. That's where the data processors, that's one of their jobs is to make sure nobody's counterfeiting these coins. Remember, there's only 21 million of them and it is immutable once something is put on this data ledger a transaction is put on the data ledger it stays on the ledger there can be updates amended to it but it the original entry stays on there all right so this here is what satoshi nakamoto this is the abstract of satoshi nakamoto's nine page white paper titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This is what set the whole industry off. Um, is Sato when Satoshi released this in 2008 to a, to a cryptographic 
um, mailing list and gained a lot of attention. So she, Satoshi introduced this anonymously again. And this is just um, the front of, of this nine page document. And it's all over the internet for anybody who wants to read it. But this document here, Satoshi outlines what Bitcoin is and Satoshi names it Bitcoin. So if, if somebody says that they have Bitcoin, then um, it can mean two things. They have what is explained in this, this, this nine page paper, or it could be what technology now today carries the name Bitcoin. The brand name Bitcoin is no longer associated with this technology. And we'll talk about that and how that happened. So, so if you're looking to own Bitcoin, as described in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper with all the superpowers, then you're gonna be surprised if you buy what today is selling as Bitcoin under the Bitcoin name, because it's a completely different technology. It's fundamentally different. And that speaks to a lot of the misunderstandings and deceptions that's in this industry due to a, a lack of oversight because it is a new industry. All right, so in 2008, Satoshi comes onto the scene with, with the white paper. In 2009, Satoshi turns that white paper into computer code with the input of the community. And in 2009, brings the Bitcoin system to life. It is working. And in 2011, Satoshi leaves. So we talked about why he maybe came in anonymously and left um, so early on. Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. So... After Satoshi Nakamoto left the community in 2011, the community lost touch with Bitcoin's, um, with Satoshi's vision for Bitcoin. The community started to disable features of Satoshi's code to better suit what they thought Bitcoin should be, which is an anonymous coin that, um, that, that is, is primarily what the community wanted it to be, is something that they could use anonymously. Bitcoin is not anonymous, it's transparent. So they, they had a very wide misunderstanding of that. But nonetheless, they started to change the code and changes were made that limited Bitcoin's capabilities and also debate over increasing Bitcoin's transaction capacity led to fundamental changes in Bitcoin's system and fragmented Bitcoin's database. Um, basically, in two, b b okay, so we'll move on. And I'll explain this in a little bit more in this next slide. So this, this slide is a pretty good one. It explains it. So it shows it visually. Um, Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. Here's a quote from Satoshi Nakamoto at the top from 2010. The nature of Bitcoin is such that, that once version 0 0.1 was released, the core design was set in stone for the rest of its lifetime. And version 0 0.1 was the first version that satoshi released so satoshi is saying i created bitcoin what i created is 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 i named it bitcoin and what bitcoin is its core design is described in my white paper and so logic would then tell us that if somebody cha fundamentally changes that they shouldn't be able to call it bitcoin right but that's not the way that it works today. As you can see here on this diagram, in 2008, shows the white paper, Bitcoin's um, white paper. And 2009, the system became activated. And in 2011, Satoshi leaves. Now, now, if Bitcoin stayed on its original path, it would follow that dotted line and would be there where it is today, where it shows Bitcoin. But currently, nobody is running an implementation that follows all of Bitcoin's rules. So technically, Bitcoin doesn't exist today as defined by Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. Because in 2011, you see that there's a fork there from the path of Bitcoin and it goes down. And that shows where the community started to disable Bitcoin's superpowers, started to change the code. And in 2007, a fundamental change was introduced by a powerful faction of the Bitcoin community, a well-funded faction, who was able to convince the data processors to stop running Satoshi's code, Satoshi's computer code, and to start running a fundamentally different computer code. And they also convinced the exchanges to allow them to take with them the brand name Bitcoin. 
So they changed Bitcoin's code and started running a different code. They fundamentally changed it. However, they took the name Bitcoin with them. So, um, and now you can see them down there at the bottom, Bitcoin BTC, and they are further away from the Bitcoin at the top there in orange. Well, anyways, um, the the remaining data processors, they kept, they said, no, we're not going to change the code. We're going to continue running this, this same code and, and this same system. Well, in 2018, they split and um, the, the majority of the community, they wanted anonymous transactions. And so they implemented um, changes to the code and start running a new code that facilitated more anonymous transactions. However, the remaining data processors that didn't change their their program the the bitcoin code they kept running the same code and they decided that that it was time to restore the bitcoin code and um and so that's what they're working on so they're, they're called bitcoin satoshi vision and their goal is to 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 be a um a running implementation that follows all of bitcoin's rules which today is there's there's no there's no coin that is doing that there's no team that is doing that so Bitcoin is not Bitcoin um, something to understand there and what is actually called Bitcoin is actually further away from the Bitcoin than than these other implementations but specifically this Bitcoin Satoshi vision you can see them they're pretty close to the Bitcoin there um, if it had followed its original path so in 2011 Bitcoin started to deviate and um, today it is what it is And this is a, a just a visual of um, the debate I mentioned earlier, how there was a big debate over scaling and the amount of transactions that can be performed per second or amount of transactions that could be fit in every 10 minute block. So currently what we call Bitcoin today, they have a block size of one megabyte. So very little transactions can go in there. And if, you, if anybody's used the, the BTC system today, they know it's very slow. They know it's very expensive. It's not going to cost you a hundredth of a cent to do a transaction there. It'll cost you dollars. In 2017, it got up to like $70. So if you want to buy a cup of coffee for $4, you're going to be paying $4 plus $70 um, if you use the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin system there. Bitcoin Cash was the other one. They, they have a 32 megabyte block, fit more transactions on that one. But the Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, just like the original Bitcoin, it has unlimited block size. So it, it, can, it can scale with demand. Um, so that's pretty. That's a pretty big thing there. Uh, and a quote here from Satoshi in 2009 uh, backs up this fact that Bitcoin should be able to scale without. Um, it should have be able to have these blocks, these large blocks, these unlimited size blocks. The existing Visa credit card network processes about 15 million internet purchases per day worldwide. Bitcoin can already scale much larger than that with existing hardware for a fraction of the cost it never really hits a scale ceiling. That was Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2009. So, all right, so how Bitcoin can alter the way we earn, spend, save, and share. So it can help us earn more because there's no trusted middleman siphoning off the money. So if we use the Bitcoin system and if it's adopted worldwide one day, it can help us earn more without the trusted middleman. We can bypass the trusted middleman and having to pay them to trust them. It allows us to earn in microtransactions. So we can earn by the micro cent. We can earn by the by. We can charge somebody a half of a cent for something, for a bit of data or for a picture or something like that, instead of having to charge them a dollar to make it um, cost effective for our current payment systems. It allows for us to earn through smart contracts, which are automated kind of contracts you can put on the blockchain. Um, theoretically, you can put on the blockchain, and they can run automatically. So I could. Me and, and, and my bandmates, we could all put an album up on the internet and we could charge a dollar for somebody to download that album and we could have it set up to, we could charge them in Bitcoin. And when somebody buys that album, we can have the smart contract um, divide up the dollar and send it to each of the, the band members' wallets instantly. And, it, and it's on the ledger and it's all recorded so we can know who, you know, make sure everything is honest. Um, and it can allow us to monetize our data. We can sell our browsing data, driving data, weather data, and all those types of things that currently we give away for free. And we really don't know what the long-term goal is for all these companies collecting our data, but we have more control over our data and we can actually earn from it with Bitcoin due to the microtransaction ability. It allows us to spend our money 
faster, cheaper, and more conveniently. We don't have to wait for banks to be open and we don't have to wait, wait for holidays. It, it's running 24 seven, 365 days a year. There's more ways to spend, to give us more power over our money. Right now, I do not, I'm not a subscriber of Netflix because I don't watch enough movies to justify paying that annual subscription or the monthly subscription. But if Netflix offered to pay in the microtransactions, so they charge me by the second to watch a movie and on average every movie costs maybe a dollar, a dollar fifty, then I would I would start using I would start using Netflix. So with Bitcoin, it can give us more ability, more control of our, our of our spending and our and our spending habits because we can now instead of having to pay and spend in subscriptions, we can pay by use, by microtransaction. It can allow us to save because we can save more because there's less money going to the trusted middleman, which means more for us. Um, there's more options to save. We can we can save by paying by the second versus paying by the subscription, like we talked about. Um, it can allow us to share through microtransactions and 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 large transactions um, versus like a Western Union. Imagine a website where um, it it allows for us to all for it allows for us to donate a penny a day to a new person's cause. Maybe somebody is around the world that needs five thousand dollars for a life changing um, uh, procedure uh, and and or life saving procedure, and they need five thousand dollars. And so maybe a website can coordinate five hundred thousand people to all donate one penny towards that individual, and that's five thousand dollars. So it gives us, it, it can allow us to, to do these microtransactions cost effectively because I can send a penny to this individual's wallet for a fraction of a penny. Whereas today, our current payment processors, they charge a lot more. Um, so there's a lot of power in the way we can share. It can allow us, give us more, it can allow us to have more control over our money, more control over our spending and allow us to have a deeper relationship with our money because all of a sudden, now we see a penny on the ground and we can say that penny could change somebody's life whereas previously a lot of people won't even won't stop to pick up a penny all right so yes bitcoin does fit within financial social work it can broaden our relationship deepen our relationship and give us more control over our money and cut out the costly middleman in a lot of situations all right back to the polling station here and this will be our final poll and I am going to ask, what was Bitcoin's first purchase for? So let's see what everybody says. I put it there. Okay, we got results coming in. Seems like everybody knows. Seems like a lot of people, a lot of people know. So people do have, have some understanding of, of um, Bitcoin's history here. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in a few seconds. All right, right there. And I'm going to share the results. So two pizzas. So everybody is correct. Uh, the majority are correct. Bitcoin's first widely publicized purchase or first purchase um, was for two pizzas and that was on may 22nd of 2010 a man paid 10,000 btc for two papa john's pizzas now btc is the trading ticker symbol the exchange ticker symbol that was given to bitcoin um and uh so in 2010 10,000 BTC was in fact 2, uh, 10,000 Bitcoin. And at that time, the worth of 10,000 Bitcoin was $41. Today, these same Bitcoins are roughly valued at $100 million. So um, this really speaks to the potential a lot of people see in Bitcoin for the value to go from you know, $41 of, um, in 10,000 Bitcoin to $100 million, quite a bit. So. Moving right along here to talk about how governments are using Bitcoin. So central banks around the world are realizing that digital currencies can have profound effects on the world financial system and are moving towards embracing black blockchain blockchain 
technology. China is leading the way in experimental testing, experimental testings of its own central bank digital currency, the digital yuan. So they are already, they already have it and they are already experimenting with their digital currency. Um, in the US here, the Advancing Blockchain Act is a US bill that was introduced, I think it was this month, September 1st, and seeks to conduct a formal study on blockchain technology in an effort to catalyze the adoption of, bit, of blockchain technology in the United States. So remember, blockchain technology, that is, that was um, Bitcoin's digital ledger. That's the blockchain technology really made its, its debut, uh, its, its, its uh, limelight appearance in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. And that is the digital ledger, the blockchain. The United States is working with MIT and other third parties to design and build a hypothetical digital currency oriented for central banks use. And the US Federal Reserve announced steps towards implementing instant payments in the United States by 2023 or 2024. So Bitcoin is fairly young. It's only about 11 years old, but its technology is being embraced. It's blockchain technology, it's digital ledger. All right. Oh. Okay, and here we go. Um, now here are some sample questions I, I pulled off of the um, SEC website, and it was actually from a statement from the SEC, the US Security and Exchange Commission's chairman, Jay Clayton, and it's just some questions, some sample questions for investors to consider a cryptocurrency or ICU, I, I, CO, uh, initial coin offering as an investment opportunity. Now I just wanna say here that the Bitcoin industry, remember, has, has low regulatory oversight because it's a new industry. So there's a lot of potential for scams and frauds. A lot, of, a lot of projects that have great ideas but don't have anything to show for them, except people are investing millions and billions of dollars in these projects that are kind of like the tech bubble back in, in, in the late 90s when people were just investing in ideas. And a lot of those ideas didn't have anything to show for them. They just went bankrupt and people lost a lot of money. Same thing has taken place here. I would add to these questions, you wanna ask, what, what is the project? Is it, is it generating um, usage? Is, is it actually up and running or is it just, is it just an idea? Um, and, but overall, it's, it's, it's probably best to, guide our clients um, to the reality of the industry and let them know that, yes, it may sound like an amazing idea. It may, it may sound like something that could change the world. However, do you really want to put your hard earned money into something that is equivalent to a gamble? So this, this industry, it's a new industry and there are a lot of mis misunderstandings, misconception. And, 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 um, and so we saw that and the Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. You'll see on TV, all the mainstream media talks about Bitcoin, and they're referring to the Bitcoin that does not follow Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. They're referring to the Bitcoin that took the brand name and is using it. Um, so be very aware and be very cautious of this industry. And if you are looking to, to research Bitcoin more, the Bitcoin Satoshi Vision um, project, their camp seems to be following and, and working towards what the real Bitcoin is. And right now, 95, approximately 95% of all the network's computing power is being um, used to, to um, process the BTC's network, because it has the brand name. About, about um, 2 percent is going to the Bitcoin Cash, and only 1 percent is going to the Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. So the Bitcoin Satoshi Vision has only 1 percent of the the data processors actually working for it versus well over 90% working for um, what is called Bitcoin today. So it, 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 is, um, it is in the minority, but um, it, is, it is really fun to, to follow this and to understand what potentially may be coming in the future. And that's everything I have. Thank you, Paul. You wanna go ahead and go back to me? Yes, I can do that. Okay. 
I do it? Yes. Well, not a simple topic, um, but you did a great job of simplifying it, and we are also appreciative. Um, before we go to Q and A, um, I wanted everybody to know that we have a webinar coming up next month on coping with the coronavirus holiday season, and then we have our November webinar. Uh, disabled doesn't have to mean financially disenfranchised. I want to mention that the Financial Social Work Certification has five workbooks and includes 20 CEUs for those who need it. It is self-study and self-paced. Our students have six months to complete it, and there is an online final exam, and students have two weeks to complete that, and they can use the materials with their clients. So as we go to see if there are some questions, uh, remember the slides are pre proprietary, they're not shared. Uh, the recording will be on our website sometime next week and on YouTube and Facebook page. Uh, no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar. So Vonda, do we have questions for Paul? We do, um, but I'll start out with the, um, uh, <laughs> they start coming in, of course, toward the end. So, Paul, we did have someone that said, wow, that was impressive, Paul. <laughs> they liked your presentation. Oh, thank you very and, much. And then um, we had a comment, um, and the comment says the Bitcoin has been associated with anarchists, not associated with any country. It may be why the founder was anonymous as well. I don't know yeah, if you want to respond to that comment or I can just leave it as a comment, but I did want yeah, to. Well, yeah, I, I, I can. <laughs> that's, that's a very good comment. And um, that is basically the mainstream narrative is that Bitcoin is anarchist. Bitcoin um, allows for anonymous transactions. Bitcoin facilitates criminal activity. But that is, that is a misunderstanding by the mainstream because if you look at the technology the, in my presentation there and I talk about Bitcoin is transparent. That public ledger is available for the public to review and, and also every transaction that's done on the Bitcoin system, if it's done for criminal activity, it's recorded in that digital ledger. It is... Um, it, it is non-mutable. That was one of the superpowers it has. You can't, you can't hide transactions on the Bitcoin system, the original Bitcoin system. Now, what Bitcoin has become today, the BTC, they do focus on anonymous transactions. They have a lightning network, their liquid um, system, and a lot of that is designed to have off-chain trans, uh, off transactions scaling. And through, they, through that system, it allows for criminal activity to be hidden. And that's one of the risks of what we call Bitcoin today is that if something um, facilitates criminal activity, the governments can, they can um, unify, work together and shut something like that down. People say Bitcoin cannot be shut down, but it can. And the central point of shutdown would be the, the, um, the miners. They can, so, um, but there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding in that, but Bitcoin is not, designed for anarchy it's designed for honesty but people have you changed the narrative and used it for for criminal activity and a lot of people have gotten caught because bitcoin is traceable um, all transactions are on the ledger and that's kind of speaking to the individual that i talked about earlier that um received the two life sentences plus the 40 years and and no possibility of parole it, it's it, it is designed to be an honest system it's just that when satoshi left everybody changed the narrative and um, started using it for criminal activity. Thank you. I, I think you just, you know, pretty much explain these next questions, which I'll just run together. And they read, can Bitcoin transactions be tracked for government purposes, including levying taxes? That's one question. The other one is, can the government prevent you from using it? Take the money, shut down your wallet, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, now, as far as the government um, 
uh, being able to track, yes, the government is, everybody is, the public is, the government, everybody can track. It's called, it's called, it's a process called chain analysis. They're, they're analyzing the blockchain. And Bitcoin was, it's, from what I can see, it is seemingly designed to be compliant with, with, with the, our current systems. It, because it's transparent, it can be tracked, and there's a, there's, there is a, 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 a record trail, there's a trail um, to, to connect anybody with, with um, criminal activity. And that's, um, and now as far as the government shutting it down, yes, governments can shut down systems. Now, usually they have a reason to shut them down if it's facilitating criminal activity. So that's why it's very important to be very cautious of any, any cryptocurrency or coin that is, that is allowing for anonymous transactions. It may sound cool to have anonymous transactions, but when it comes to interfacing with laws and the government, it's not cool. It is actually something that they will shut down and they will find a way. So um, that's why it's very important to be very cautious of these projects and find out, are they legal? You know, do they comply? Does the project even exist? You know, is it just an idea? So, but yeah, good questions. Okay, so let's see. What happened to the original Bitcoin tokens acquired under Satoshi's name? Did they convert to BTC and adjust value to their new market? Yeah, that's a good question. So Satoshi was the was the first one to maintain the system. And by maintaining the system, Satoshi every 10 minutes on average, um, uh, or, or the, the, the data process at the time were receiving 50 Bitcoin on average every 10 minutes. And Satoshi was one of the main ones that was, that was, that was um, maintaining the system in the early years. And so Satoshi um, supposedly earned, you know, in excess of 800,000 Bitcoin, um, close to a million Bitcoin. And so that's worth billions of dollars today. And because Satoshi mined those early on when Bitcoin was Bitcoin, um, after all of the forks that took place, when the database was split, that one, uh, that one chart I was showing you with the, the splits and the forks, um, every time there's a split, um, a, essentially the, the, the coin duplicates um, into the next project. And so Satoshi would, would have copies of, would have the same amount of coins in each of the projects so he basically it's like a it's, it's almost like a stock when it splits you get the um you get this well it's probably not the best example but yeah satoshi has has the same amount of coins in bitcoin bitcoin cash and bitcoin satoshi vision okay thank you uh let's see what we have hmm. Okay, I think we probably have a couple of questions, they'll word it differently. They want to know, how do you connect with the real Bitcoin? Well, that's or a really good question. Bitcoin. Yes, yes, very good. Very good question. Well, um, at, the, at the moment, there is no implementation of, the, of, of Bitcoin as defined by, Bit, by Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. So you, you, really, you really can't. Um, there is only one project, one team, one, one, one token that I've been able to uncover whose goal is to take the, the, the current chain and the state it is, it, it, as it is, and they took it over in 2018, um, and to actually restore it to the original Bitcoin vision. So their, their team is called the Bitcoin, or the coin is called the Bitcoin Satoshi vision, and hence in the name, they are trying to follow Satoshi's vision. So even them right now, they are not, they're still trying to um, kind of fix all of the things that were broken and changed before they started restoring the, 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 the code. The, so right now, there is no, no one following it. The closest we have today to to what Bitcoin is, um, as described in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, is the Bitcoin Satoshi vision. Only 1% on average of the, of the data processors are actually working for that, that implementation or that derivative. 
of the Bitcoin system, and all over 90% are, are, are still use are still working for the Bitcoin that has the Bitcoin brand name and the Bitcoin uh, ticker symbol BTC, and largely because those Bitcoins are valued. Um, I mean, it's like they sell for uh, like around, I think just recently it was around $10,000 a coin. So they, they want those six and a, and a quarter coins because every 10 minutes, that's six, that's over $60,000. That's basically they're mining. They're mining six and a quarter coins at $10,000 a coin. That's over $60,000 every 10 minutes. So they're all focusing their computing power over there. But, um, that is it, it it is not that that system is not following bitcoin's rules so for them to call themselves bitcoin is um potentially a form of of uh, uh consumer fraud and um because the exchanges are selling when people go to the exchange and they say i want to buy bitcoin they're getting something that's fundamentally different than what satoshi nakamoto created in his white paper so thank you um, I guess that then kind of goes or aligns with this question. Um, the, it reads, can you talk a little bit about other cryptocurrencies besides Bitcoin? Yeah, sure. Well, um, so what happened was back in 2011, um, let's talk about where those big, where those cryptocurrencies came from. Currently, there's there's thousands of cryptocurrencies out there. Most of them are scams and, and frauds and have no working system, have no, they're just ideas, ideas to try to trick investors to give them their money. So, but the reason why they exist is because when Bitcoin was, was changed and sort of broken early on by the community that wanted to change it for their own um, desires, when that happened, Bitcoin's superpowers basically were stripped away and that allowed for a new market to open where all these other individuals were like, hey, we can, we can now create a coin better than Bitcoin. We can do, we can do everything Bitcoin coin can do, but better. And we can do it for this market. And we can, we can create a, bit, a, a Bitcoin for, for, the, um, for like the laundry market. We can create a, a Bitcoin for, you know, we can create our own form of Bitcoin. So all these thousands of Bitcoin arose because the original Bitcoin was broken. However, if the original Bitcoin wasn't broken and stripped away of its powers early on, it could do everything that all these new coins, all these new tokens say that they can do, the original Bitcoin can do and do better and do more efficiently. So the only reason they exist is because um, the original Bitcoin was changed and, and fundamentally changed. Um, so we but we look at these new cryptocurrencies or these cryptocurrencies i think the largest the second largest cryptocurrency market cap is is called ethereum and ethereum it it um it can't scale it costs i think on average nowadays like seven dollars to do an, a transaction on the ethereum network so if i wanted to go to starbucks and buy a cup of coffee for four dollars and i wanted to pay for it in ethereum I would have to pay the four dollars plus seven dollars to to um, to pay for the transaction fee for Ethereum versus what Bitcoin was designed to do is have like a very low transaction fee of maybe a thousandth of a cent, a hundredth of a cent. So you compare that to seven dollars, it shows that Ethereum can't scale. They um, it, the system it can't scale, and any system that can't scale is going to have a high transaction fee because people are are competing against one another to outbid the other person to try to get their transaction in before the other person. So they're, they're, they're saying, I'll pay the data processor more. I'll pay them $2, $3, $4, just get, just get my transaction process now. So but there's a lot of cryptocurrencies out there that they don't have a working blockchain. They don't, they don't have um, any work behind them. They're, they're just ideas and they're trying to get money. And um, so, in large, the whole cryptocurrency, all those thousands of coins, they all exist because Bitcoin was was broken early on or it was fundamentally changed early on. So that kind of lets you know that they're all just they're all just filling a um, a void that was created because Bitcoin was broken early on. But if Bitcoin is ever implemented as as 
intended and it scales and it's adopted, all those other coins will basically have really no competitive edge against Bitcoin because it'll be, it'll actually be working correctly. Well, I want to come in and I want to thank everyone for hanging in, for asking such great questions. Most of all, I want to very much thank Paul McCourse for your knowledge, for making the time to share it with the financial social work community. And I want to invite everyone to come back next month and join us um, for our next free monthly webinar. Vonda, thank you. Paul, thank you. And everyone, stay well and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.